19, 1, when you have it, say amen. amen. Let us read the first through the third verse together. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Can you say amen? amen. Look at verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Remain standing, we're going to pray, but I want to talk to you tonight about Jezebel's voice. Jezebel's haunting, earing, creepy, intimidating, her voice. If you overcome her voice, you're going to move into another realm of victory. The only thing standing in between you and your prophecy, your destiny, what God has ordained for you to have, the last weapon the devil hath left is Jezebel's voice. I want to talk to you tonight about her voice. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, send an anointing. The kind of anointing that makes preaching relevant and simplistic and powerful and profound. In other words, we want you to preach tonight. We came to hear you. All of us want to hear you preach tonight. If you don't preach tonight, we came for nothing. We're hungry to hear your word. Speak in this house. Give direction in this house. Give structure and order and revelation in this house. While these lips of clay are moving, Lord, I pray that you would get in somebody's heart and speak a life-changing word. <laughs> I believe you to do it. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, seated in the presence of the Lord. There's one thing that I have a great appreciation for. It is God's word. This means so much to look into his word. I think one of the great tragedies of our generation is that we have tended to move away from the integrity of the text to superficial dispersions of human concepts and philosophies that do not bring life. We have raised up a generation whose whole message can be deduced down to praise the Lord. Behind every song and every message and every sermon is just a new dress on the same thought. Praise the Lord. And as much as I believe in praising God, still I am concerned that we're not hearing much music or ministry that reflects the totality of all that God would say to his people. Because when I get through praising him, I have got to fight the good fight of faith. And I need to hear some things that are going to arm me and fill my quiver with the kinds of arrows that allows me to penetrate the infrastructure of the enemy and get the victory. Because I, for one, am tired of shouting about something that I'm not possessing. David said, he teaches my fingers to war. The apostle said, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. Every now and then, we have to call the camp in and have a meeting with the whole camp of Israel so that we can instruct the gener next generation of Satan's devices so that they will not fall prey to the same things that we fell prey to. For to be forewarned is to be forearmed. We've got to know 
what is going on. Jesus says something to his disciples. He spent hours teaching and ministering to them. And I think we need more times of just teaching and, and ministry and sharing one with another. Not just in church, but I mean at the restaurant and at the hotel and riding in the car. I, I think we've got to move away from just superficial chit-chat. And start using every opportunity to strengthen one another. Because you don't know who's going through a fight right around. I don't, I don't have time for mindless chatter. <laughs> I don't want to hear about the stock market. I need to understand some things that will cause me to be catapulted into my destiny. Because tick, 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 tick. I am running out of time. The Bible says knowing the time. That it is high time. See, when you know how late it is, there's a new maturity that comes up in you where you don't want to hear a lot of foolishness. Can you imagine what it would have been like to sit up under Jesus' ministry? Every moment with him was an opportunity to glean. I think that when we get around truly great men and women of God, we need to be taught and shut up. Because you only have a few moments to catch the totality of what God has invested in them in a whole lifetime. And you have to hear what the Spirit is saying to the chat. To be around somebody who has been with God is an awesome opportunity to glean wisdom. If you don't catch it all, just catch it a little bit. Just catch it like the, the, like the Syrophoenician. I'm just catch a crumb. Just, just get a crumb, just a crumb. A crumb is enough to change your life. And so Jesus taught while they were on the boat. And he taught while they were on the seashore. And he taught when they were in the desert. And he taught when they were in the house. And when they invited him to dinner, he taught while they were breaking bread together. When they walked down the road to Emmaus, he was always teaching, 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 teaching them because he knew that he only had a certain amount of time to put a real deposit in them. And after you get the deposit, life is going to make a withdrawal. And woe be unto you if life withdraws draws more than God has had an opportunity to deposit in your life. Some of you now are operating in the red. Because life is withdrawing more than you have allowed God to deposit. And that's what causes your heart to be overwhelmed. And that's what causes you to be stressed out. And that's what causes you to be intimidated when life draws more than God has deposited. Jesus ministered through everything. He ministered through taxes. He said, go down to the fish and get in the fish's mouth. I'll show you how to pull money out of his mouth. He ministered through the breaking of bread. He took it and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, eat. And the Bible said that when they saw the breaking of bread, their eyes were opened up. He ministered through sandwiches, two fish and five loaves of bread and said, let me show you what I can do if you go through brokenness and still praise me. Let me show you how I can bless you through the breaking of life. Hear that said something amongst all of the many, many awesome, powerful, life-changing things that were said. Something that I want to use as a base to build on tonight. He said, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger they will not follow. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else's sheep, but he said, my sheep. <laughs> I can't speak for the general board and the, the committee and the willing to work committee and the church got it going on and incorporated. I can't speak for all of the sects and divisions and groups and all. He said, but my sheep may only be two on your whole pew, but he said, my sheep. See, we're dealing, we're living in a layer of the sin age where God is calling a church out of a church. He's knocking on the door of church structure and, and say, he that has an ear, let him hear. He's knocking right at the door and said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice, I may not get in the whole thing, but if any man hear my voice, I will come in and sup with him and I shall be his God and he shall be my people. God will take
take you if he can't get your whole house. He'll take you if he can't get the whole pew. He'll take you if he can't get the whole committee. God said, if you open up, I'll come in and shop with you. And as many of us have assumed the awesome task of allowing him to break us and reshape us and make us, we have earned the privilege of being called his sheep. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. I'm his. <laughs> How about you? That's why there are certain things you can't do to me because I'm his. He won't let you abuse me, but so bad because I am his. He wants you to touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. That boy is mine. There was so much respect for it in the Old Testament that even in Saul's backslidden state, David was afraid to touch him. He said, I won't touch him even in his sin. He's still God's in the Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Some things I don't even say nothing about. Because if I see God's anointing on you, I don't, I don't touch you. You might not do it like I do it. You may not skip like I skip. You may not dance like I dance. But if I see God's anointing on you, I don't say nothing about it. Because if it's all right with God, it's all right with me. <laughs> It's all right with me. He said, my sheep know my voice. <laughs> they're not figuring it out. They're not wondering about it. They're not going into a fast trying to study it out. They absolutely emphatically know my voice. Not my word, my voice. See, this generation is all into knowing his word. And it's nice to know his word. But the devil knows his word. It's not enough to know his word. When you're going through hell and high water, baby, you got to know his voice. When you got two or three or four doors open up to you and you don't know whether it's door number one, door number two, door number three, door number four, door number five, it's not enough to know his word. You have to know his voice. Which one, Lord, speak to my heart? Holy Spirit, show me which job do I take? Which one do I marry? Which business do I go in? Do I buy this or not buy? I need to know your voice. Some of you are in trouble right now because you listen to the wrong voice. <laughs> You're living in hell right now because you listen to the wrong voice. You're working a job that feels like a prison because you listen to the wrong voice. I won't even touch marriage. He says, my sheep know my voice. But notice, he didn't say my lambs. See, in the lamb state, you don't know his voice. You have to mature and go from being a lamb to being a sheep. He said, I can't speak for the elementary stages of your Christian development. In the juvenile searchings and seekings of your development, you may be uncertain, but, but as you come into your own and develop a state of maturity, Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. This is not boy talk. This is man talk. This is not lamb talk. This is sheep talk. My sheep. No, my boy. It's a shame and an insult for you to walk with God a long time and still not know his voice. It's an insult for you to walk with God a long time and still be unstable, jumping from church to church and place to place and ministry to ministry and man to man. And After you've been with him a long time, when you say you heard from God, we expect you to know that you have heard from God. Because the book said, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger 
they will not follow. Excuse me, but I've been walking with God too long to follow just anything. I don't shout off of just anything. I don't dance off of just anything. You can't hand me no junk and then ask me why I don't flow with it because I've been walking with him long enough that I know his voice. When you know his voice, you'll recognize that I don't care what kind of box it comes wrapped in. It might be in a white box. It might be in a black box. It might be in a brown box. But if you're listening for his voice, you don't care nothing about the box. You just want to get the voice. It might come through a woman. It might come to a man. He may even lose a, use a child. But if you learn his voice, you can hear him speak through your children. I know this sounds kind of crazy. But when you really know his voice, you can overhear your children playing. And God can use something that they said to speak to your heart. When you really know his voice, God can speak to you through a commercial. He can speak to you through a road sign on the highway when you know. to know his voice. My, my Pentecostal upbringing causes me to put a great deal of significance on the tongue. It is our conviction that the tongue and the speaking thereof in the language of the Spirit is the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. That through that tongue, the gifts of the Spirit begin to operate and word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecies and all types of miracles and signs and wonders uh, evolve out of that initial experience uh, that Acts 1 and 8 declares you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and also in Acts 2 they spake as the Spirit of God gave utterance in Acts 10 they spoke again as the Spirit of God gave utterance in Acts 19 19 years after the day of Pentecost they were still speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance the Apostle Paul said I thank God I speak in tongues more than ye all so we understand the power of the tongue but after walking with God a long time I moved into another regime of truth and integrity and I didn't learn it so much from theology I learned it from a speech therapist for I notice that when you bring children to a speech therapist and they notice that the therapist has a, that the child has an impediment that they do not speak correctly or precisely, I would have thought immediately they would x-ray the throat and check out the larynx and check out the voice box. But that's not where they start. Whenever there is a problem with the child's ability to articulate or speak specifically, they do not check the tongue, the lips, the mouth, or the esophagus. Where they start their research is with the ear. Because the first thing that makes them suspicious that there is a speech impediment evolves around the fact that they must not be able to hear because the speaking of the mouth is just an outflowing of what the ear has taken in. It is, are you getting where I'm saying tonight? It is their conviction, therefore, that the first most logical problem that needs to be eradicated immediately is the possibility that maybe the child is not speaking correctly because he or she is not hearing correctly. Now, when I heard that, I began to suddenly recognize that Jesus didn't spend a whole lot of time talking to people about tongues. But he did say, he that hath an He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. You see, the reason I speak English is because I heard my parents speaking in English. And I began to speak out of my mouth what I heard with my ear. If I had heard them speak Russian, I would have spoken out of my mouth what I heard with my ear. And so Jesus is not so worried about trying to get us to speak. He's trying to get us to hear because if we can hear what the Spirit is saying, then utterly the mouth will always speak what the ear can hear. He say can you hear him yeah. you've got to be able to hear him you'll never be able to speak if you can't hear him you won't even be able to speak in tongues if you cannot 
hear him. The Bible said in Acts 2 that they spake, they spake, they spake, they spake as the Spirit of God gave them utterance, language, glossolalia, the ability to speak. In other words, their mouth imitated what their ear heard. Anybody who has the baptism of the Holy Spirit will tell you that you can hear the Holy Ghost speaking inside of you even when you don't open your mouth. You Sometimes you can't speak out of your mouth what you hear in your spirit. You're sitting at work at the computer. You're operating at the terminal. People are gathered all around you. All of a sudden the Holy Ghost starts speaking down in your belly. You can hear it in your spirit, but you choose not to speak it out of your mouth. Whenever you do speak, you are only speaking out what you hear. He that hath an ear. If you can hear what the Holy Ghost is speaking, then it's your job to give vent out of your mouth to what you have heard with your ear. So the real challenge to teaching people how to move into deeper levels of spirituality is not to get them to speak. It is to get them to hear because there is no way you can hear heaven's language in your ear and not speak it out of your mouth sooner or later you will open up your mouth and begin to speak outwardly what you hear inwardly the inner ear i heard him he called me to preach and i heard he told me which woman was my woman. He said, not her, not her, not her, not her, that one. And I heard him. I'm happy right now because I heard him. I didn't know how to pick a wife then that would fit me now, but I heard him. I didn't know what I was going to be doing 20 years later, but I heard him if you can hear what god is saying god will cause you to make decisions now that bless you for the next 20 years if you can hear every blessing you ever got it wasn't because you were smart it's just that you fooled around and heard him People are jealous of you right now. They don't know that it's not that you got it going on. You don't know how to raise children like that. You didn't know how to budget your finances like that. You didn't know how to buy that property or build that building. But tell three people, tell them I heard him. I heard him. I heard him. I heard him. That's how I got it. I heard him. I heard him. That's how I got out of debt. I heard him. That's how I got the victory. That's how I overcame the fight. I heard him. set the salad to the side and move to the entree. Enough of that lettuce. Let's get down to something we can really chew. I love the Old Testament because it affords me the privilege and the opportunity of looking into the lifestyles of the people that God used. Unlike the New Testament, which is preoccupied with concepts, the Old Testament goes deeper than just teaching the concepts and allows me to examine the character of the men who developed the concept. That is important to me because I need to see common, ordinary people like me being used of God. I need to be able to see their strengths and weaknesses because I begin to understand that if God could use David, then maybe, just maybe, he can still use me. If God can use Ezekiel, maybe, just maybe, he can still use me. If, if God can use Jeremiah, who backslid and quit preaching and said, I'm not going to be bothered with none of them no more, ever, no time. And still the word of the Lord was like fire shut up in his bones. Then maybe God can still use me. Ezekiel told God, when God asked Ezekiel, can the bones live again? He said, Lord, thou knowest. Then, then, then if, if, if you can get the victory in a valley full of dry bones, even though you don't even have enough faith to know whether they can get up again, then maybe God can still. If God can.
can use Rahab, then maybe God can still use me. If God can use Ruth the Moabitess, the idolatrous woman, then maybe God can still use me. If God can use Tamar who slept with her father-in-law and had two children, two twins born out of an illicit affair, if God can allow her to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ, then maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, God can still use me. Maybe he can look beyond my fault and see my need, maybe. Tell somebody, say, he can still use it. I know you're messed up, but he can still use it. I know people are talking about your past, but he can still use it. I know people are turning up their nose and they don't believe you're saved right now, but God can still use it. And we look at the peaks and the valleys of life because life is a roller coaster. It's not a straight line between two points. It has many twists and turns, peaks and valleys, pinnacles and ravines. It has many elevations in life. Then there are moments that you cascade down into the depths of despair and think that you will never get out again but go. <laughs> and when we begin to look at Elijah, we are looking at one of the peaks. He, he comes on the scene on Mount Carmel. He is God's man of faith. And Power. He stands against 450 prophets of Baal. He confronts every last one of them. He is indignant and full of rage because they have dared to insist that their God is the true God. And so he gets a shovel and he commands that ditches be dug. And they dug ditches around the altar. And then they took stones and laid stones in the midst of the ditches. And then they put wood on top of the stones. And then they put the sacrifice on top of that. And they filled the ditches with water. And then he said, now if your God is everything that you say he is, get your God to answer by fire and consume and the 450 prophets all of them got together incantations hexes spells curses demonic power satanism witchcraft all of the black magic that they could muster still could not conjure up a god who could answer them they became so frustrated that in their frustration they began to bicker and to cut themselves with knives because suddenly they recognized the disgrace of following a god that has no power when they finally were exasperated i feel like preaching tonight you know when they were finally exasperated, he says, step back, boys, and let me show you what a real God will do. He began to call on a God who can answer. What I like about God is when you call him, he will answer you. You're not serving some little God that was carved out of stone or made out of wood. You're not serving no God you had to buy at the store and set up on your mantle. You're not serving a God that was made out of a clay pot that some old lady set up and painted his face on him. No, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. If you call him, he will act. The Bible said this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but you've been in a fight with the enemy and the enemy is trying to make you think that your God don't love you. But that devil is a liar. The Lord sent me here to tell you, he heard you. He already heard you and help is on the way. devil chasing cancer rebuking mind regulating heart fixing God he's the God who sits on the circle of the earth and he's got all power in his hand he's the God whose ear is not heavy that he cannot hear and his arm is not short that he cannot say he told Jeremiah call upon me and see if I will not answer you if you call on Jesus he will Who 
Jesus. A fire. Good God Almighty. Fire! Oh yes. I'm not talking about some little butane fire. I'm not talking about some little matchstick fire. I'm not talking about the fire you cook your chicken with. I'm talking about a supernatural Holy Ghost fire. For the Bible said that when he answered by fire, now there's something that this fire did that is distinctive. I wasn't too impressed when it burned up the wood because any fire will burn up wood. But when the Bible said it licked up the water, I start recognizing that natural fire is put out by water, but God's got a fire that water can't put out. He's got a fire. If it ever starts burning in you, can't nobody fan it out. Can't nobody deluge it out. Can't nobody sprinkle it out. If God ever sets your life on fire, tell somebody, tell them I'm on fire. I hate to keep jumping up in front of you, baby, but I'm on fire. I hate to keep dancing on your shoe, but I'm on fire. I didn't mean to step on your pocketbook, madam, but I'm on fire. I know I shout too loud, but I... up the stones God's got a fire that'll burn up a rock it'll burn up the hard things in your life that thing that's standing up in your life and saying I will not move the devil is a lie if you call fire down on that thing God will burn it up that thing that's standing up in your finances and saying I'm too hard to be moved that devil is a liar if you call fire down God's gonna burn that thing up in fact I want you to know before the year is out you're gonna see God burning up things that the devil lifted up in your face that rock is about to burn out of the oil Tell three people tell them this is my year. This is my time to be blessed. This is my time to come into my own. God's gonna burn every stone out of my way. God's gonna burn every rock out of my way. God's gonna lick the water out of my way. He promised me fire. I will have it. I must have it. I shall have it. I prayed for it and it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. In fact, God said, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Shake somebody's hand like you're gonna shake it off and tell them this is your year for fire. This is your year for fire. This is your year for fire. 1997, this is your year for fire. That's why the devil's upset. This is your year. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. This is your year. Somebody shout fire! That's what I want you to do next time you come up against a rock in a hard place. And the devil's laughing at you and saying, I'm gonna mess with you. I don't care if it's in the operating room. I don't care if it's looking at the x-rays out of the doctor's office. And he says, madam, you got cancer. Just stand right over top of the desk and shout fire! Go in the bank where they said they're not going to let you build that house. And they said they were not going to give you the money. But stand right over top of the desk and say, fire! Your God is a consuming fire. Hey! Before you sit down, touch hands with three people and tell them, get ready for fire this year. Yes. That fire he told you about in January. 
That fire he promised you at the beginning of the year. That fire he told you he was gonna give you. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get 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 destroyed the prophets of Baal and went on with the victory. God who has began a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I don't know why it is, but I feel like I'm preaching right directly to somebody in this room. and exaltation of victory. He comes down off of Mount Carmel with the smell of smoke still in his clothes. Victory in his mind. Dancing in his feet. He comes down off of Mount Carmel having made an open display of the principalities and powers that were trying to bind up his life. He came down off of Mount Carmel in a spirit of exuberation and exaltation because God had proven once again his faithfulness, his might, his anointing, and his victory. I'm telling you, when you go through something like that and you come down, anybody looking at you can tell you got the victory. It'll make you kind of pimp a little bit, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, it will. If your sister to make you kind of sash a little bit when you when you when you when you when you beat the devil back out of your house and off your children, it'll make you kind of strut a little. Hey! Hallelujah! We have the victory. And they have, oh carnal, half-delivered, flu-foot, partially religious, one foot in the church, one foot in the world, Ahab was gossiping to his sneaky, low-down, treacherous, despicable, cunning, vicious, venomous wife, Jezebel. Jezebel, the tramp the enemy sent to infiltrate the Israelites, the slut the enemy sent behind the ranks of the righteous to plant a seed of idolatry, to diffuse the glorious light of the gospel of God himself. Jezebel. The cunning trick of the enemy, one of his tools that he used to come against Israel, he sent, oh, Jezebel, you understand her. You often hear about Jezebel's paint. And the old church used to talk about Jezebel and they used her to talk about makeup. They talked about Jezebel because she painted her face. And they thought that if they would teach the women not to paint their face, they could destroy the spirit of Jezebel. 
but they didn't know that it's not it's something you buy in a bottle. It's a spirit. It's not something you push out of a tube. It's a spirit. That you can stop her paint, but you can't stop her spirit. She was treacherous. She was cunning. She was far worse than Delilah. Jezebel. That snake that slithered into the camp of Israel and attached herself to the king of Israel and tied herself around the waist of Ahab and began to suck the strength out of his life until he was so weakened and broken down that he was diluted in his theology polluted in his praise and a disgrace to his calling because he had entered into covenant with a snake. He had married Jezebel. Jezebel, the secret weapon of the devil. Whenever he gets ready to destroy the integrity of the righteous, he'll do it by getting you to enter into relationship with Jezebel. For whosoever you lend your members to, that becomes your Lord. If it's got your body, it's got you. Jezebel! She was more than gussy than gaudy. She was lewd and promiscuous. She had no morality and no standing. She was a tramp of the lowest kind. And she had attached herself not to one of the barbaric dogs, not to one of the uncircumcised Philistines. No, she had attached herself to Israel itself because there's something about evil that is never satisfied until it enters into covenant with somebody that's right. Whenever you're on your way up, the enemy will always send a false friend Somebody that the devil sends to say, I know you're going through something. And I know you've been kind of lonely. And I, I just come into your life to be your friend. I come to tell you, don't you take everybody to be your friend. I don't care how lonely you are. Don't take everybody to be your friend. Go ahead and cry if you got to cry. But don't take everybody to be your friend. Go ahead and rock yourself to sleep. But don't take everybody to be your friend. Take your pillow and use it as if it was a person and hug it. But don't take. Because God sent me to warn you against Jezebel. has attached herself like a sucker on an ear of corn to draw the life out of their praise, out of their worship, out of their consecration. And the longer she was there, the weaker they got. She tore down their worship because the thing that the devil is always jealous about is the worship of God. And so he will send anything into your life to get you so tied up that you stop worshiping. Watch out for those things that come in your life and they stop you from going to church. It's the spirit of Jezebel. You're too tired to go. You're too busy to go. Anything to break down your worship, you got to stay home and watch your car. You got, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to watch the stock market and you got to carry your kids to the football game. Watch out for Jezebel. She left the worship of God. And if you do come, she'll let you sit there and be so self-righteous and sanctimonious that you're just too intelligent to shout like that, aren't you? Oh, no, no, you're just not that kind of person, are you? You're not emotional, are you? But I saw you at the football game, knocking popcorn over in the floor, threw your hot dog down in somebody's lap, started jumping like a monkey over a game, and yet, you, sir, Watch out for Jezebel. She'll intimidate you and you don't want your co-workers to see you on TV dancing. What would the boys think at work if they saw tears 
gushing down your face. It is the spirit of Jezebel. She wants to rob God of his glory. When they told Jezebel that the prophet Elijah had withstood her teachings and her adulterous manipulation of theology, had withstood her cunning sexuality, had not bowed to the shrine of her lust. When they told Jezebel that one man had said, said no to her lewd conduct. That one man had stood up against the temptation to lay in her lust ridden arms. When they told Jezebel that one man had withstood 450 of her prophets and all of them were dead, she was enraged. She was furious because anytime you don't bow to the enemy, he gets indignant. Somebody asked me, what did I think about the fight between Holyfield and Tyson? And I said, the only thing wrong with the fight is that they had all of the men making comments were sportscasters. And they knew about sports, but they didn't know about God. I wish they'd have let a preacher comment on the fight. See, you have to know something about God to understand what happened in the ring. Now, normally, God don't be bothered with no boxing matches. But when old Holyfield came in there talking about, I will dance like David danced, it turned that thing from a natural fight into spiritual warfare. Anytime you come against an enemy in the name of the Lord, demons get upset. Hell starts itching. Principalities get nervous. I know Tyson don't know what came over him. It wasn't Tyson. It was the enemy. Anytime you come in the name of the Lord, that devil gets upset. He got so mad. He broke the rules. He broke the rules, and endangered his career, endangered his mind. Nobody would do that in their right mind. The spirit of the enemy looked out through leering, treacherous eyes and saw that boy dancing in the Holy Ghost. And he hated his dance so bad that he ran on the air. I'm not shocked. That's the same thing the devil's been doing for years. When you start dancing, the devil wants to bite your ear. But I'm glad greater is he than in the earth. Yes! 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 Just somebody tell him I may be bitten. But I'm not beaten. <laughs> that old devil, he might have bitten me, but I'm not beaten. He might have bitten me, but I'm not beaten. I'm going to get the victory. I may be bleeding, but I'm going to get the victory. I may be hurting, but I'm going to get the victory. I may be embarrassed, but I'm going to get the victory. When it's all said and done, it is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Say it the Lord. Say yes. Just send the people and shout victory. That's what he's gonna give you. 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 That 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 he's gonna give you victory. 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 Stand. Having done all to stand. Stand. So when Jezebel heard about Elijah, she was furious with the kind of rage that only comes from demonic interference. Can I preach this thing tonight? Yeah. 
She could have sent chariots against him, but she didn't. She could have sent soldiers after him, but she didn't. She could have threw a knife, but she didn't. Shot an arrow, but she didn't. She opened her mouth and cleared her throat and sent her voice against him. She never laid a hand on him. She didn't even spit on him. She sent her voice against him because she knew the power of a voice. She just threatened him and said, so let the gods do to me if by tomorrow about this time I have not destroyed you. She didn't touch him. She just threatened him. And the same man who called fire down on Mount Carmel and withstood 450 prophets of Baal stepped right in the midst of witchcraft and overthrew principalities and powers. The same man who had the courage enough to face death for his conviction was terrified, not over a woman, but over her voice. She sent her mouth against him. Whenever you're on the verge of success, the enemy will send his mouth against you. You're looking for him to fight you in the physical, but no, 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 no. You're too strong for that. He's going to change his weaponry. He will open his mouth against you. She opened her mouth and said, what? Now, you don't understand that if you don't understand what the New Testament said when it said the enemy goeth about as a roaring, not a biting lion, a roaring lion. It's not his teeth you have to worry about. It's his voice. He roars against you. For if you understand anything about the lion, whenever he gets ready to attack his prey, he knows that technically he can't outrun the rabbit. But if he can terrify the rabbit, it will lock up the rabbit's ability to be mobile. What he does, he paralyzes the rabbit with fear. He roars! that the rabbit forgets he can move and stands there in terror so that he can devour him. And that's what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to roar against you so that you forget how to pray and you forget how to dance and you forget what God told you he was gonna do in your life and you're standing there scared to death over his You won't understand this unless you've been to elementary school like I did. And got through third period. You're getting ready to go to lunch at your locker. You're getting your little lunch box out. And had somebody come over to the locker and say, after school. I'm going to tear you up. I'm going to beat you like Kaomi. When that bell rings at three o'clock, it's going to be me and you. Meet me after school. And the whole rest of the day. You walking around saying, but I didn't say what they said that I said about him, no way. And I don't understand why they're going to jump on me. I didn't do nothing. It don't make any sense. And I don't know what I'm going to do. They're going to get me out of school. And you can't think. And you flunk the test. And you can't add. And you can't multiply. And you can't subtract. And the boy ain't even touched you. He just sent his voice. Jezebel sent her voice. Against him. Her voice, her voice. And the Lord gave me this message to minister to the church. 
because some of you are living with Jezebel's voice. <laughs> Jezebel's voice is a threat hanging over your life now. Where the devil says, you know your mama died of cancer. You're going to get it too. And no matter how successful you are, in the back of your mind, you hear that threat. You're going to get it too. Your daddy couldn't stay with your mama. You're not going to be able to stay with your wife either. The threat. You know your brother's an alcoholic. You're going to go back to drinking too. The threat. He doesn't touch you. He just threatens You got a couple of bills passed due, and he can let you see them taking your house and taking your car, and you can see yourself pushing a cart down the street, starving to death and broke without a home. It's a threat. His voice hanging over your head robs you of the moments of victory that God has given you. Oh, you got the victory. Yeah, you got the victory, but the problem is, if you don't get rid of the voice, you can't enjoy it. Because somewhere in the back of your mind, while you're eating dinner and when you're laying in the bed at night, and when you're driving your nice little car to your nice little job, to your nice little office to get your nice little check, you know what Jezebel's voice is saying to you? It ain't going to last. Somewhere while you're laying in the arms of your husband or your wife and you finally found somebody who appreciates you and loves you and cares about you and things are finally starting to go good for you, you can't even relax in a moment of embrace because in the back of your mind, Jezebel's voice is saying, it ain't going to last. And so you're in a place of blessings, but you don't feel blessed and you don't react blessed because if the enemy can't stop you from being blessed, he'll haunt you with a threat. You're going to die. What about your children? Have you ever had a little threat? Now, shh, because I know you ain't told nobody. Jezebel's voice just whispers in your ear. Nobody knows but you. That down on the inside, you are scared to death that this is not going to last. You're dealing with Jezebel's voice. You can't even take a decent shower without feeling for lumps in your breast. Ain't nothing wrong but the devil threatening you. Say, you know, your sister got breast cancer. You're going to get it too. It is Jezebel's. Oh, you hear how quiet it's gotten? You know why it's gotten quiet? Because Jezebel is nervous. God sent me after her voice. Watch out, Jesse. I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you, girl. You come to kill and steal and destroy. You want to rob us of peace and victory and anointing. But hey, ho, devil, you got to go. It is the voice of Jezebel. It's the voice that made the prophet hide behind the tree. And the mighty man of God wanted to die after just having great victory in his life. He sunk into such depression that he absolutely wanted to die. He 
despaired of life. Not because of a knife or a gun. He was worried about Jezebel's voice. What do I do if things go wrong? What do I do if I don't get out of this? What do I do if I come home from work and you're gone? What do I do if they lay me off? What do I do if my stepchildren break my heart and tell me I am not their real mother anyway? What do I do if my marriage falls apart like last time? It is the voice of Jezebel. Oh, it doesn't use makeup. It's dressed up in depression and discouragement and fear and anxiety. Jezebel's voice will cause you to get indigestion. You can buy a steak, but you can't digest it. You got a brand new bed, but you can't sleep in it. You got a wonderful house, but you can't rest in it. It is the voice of Jezebel taunting you, haunting you. You're scared to get a certified letter. You're scared to open up a mailbox. You're scared when the phone rings. You're scared every board meeting, every business meeting, every time your husband calls and says, I got something I need to talk to you about. You're scared. You're washing his clothes and searching his pockets and looking for notes. You're scared. It is the voice of Jezebel taunting you and flaunting you, hindering you. Every time she spends too long or talks to anybody, you can't even hold a conversation for looking to see who she's talking to because you have been hurt before and Jezebel's voice is telling you it's going to happen again and all you dance and all you shout and yes you leap and run up and down the house but still in spite of all of that you can still hear Jezebel's voice made the mighty man want to die I wonder tonight, has anybody in this room ever heard Jezebel's voice? <laughs> it brought him to the juniper tree and he thought that he was going to die. And at his lowest moment in total despair and debauchery, it looked like things were going to come to an end. But in the moment of his greatest defeat, God sent an angel. Have you ever had God send an angel? Just at the nick of time, when you're about to break down up under pressure and stress, and you say, my God, I can't take anymore. Isn't it amazing how God will send you what you need when you need it to get out of the rut? Have you ever had God come like a paramedic? He comes in to the middle of a wreck. He comes in the middle of a crisis and says, I love you too much to leave you hurting like this. I love you too much to leave you in pain like this. I love you too much. And the Bible said that he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days. Some of you right now, you're going in the strength of a meat that you don't even know where it came from. Just at the moment of your greatest weakness, God sent you help. You don't even know what encouraged you, but God sent help. You went to bed depressed and woke up happy. You don't even know what you're happy about. But isn't it amazing how God will step in and encourage you? Have you ever gotten encouraged and you couldn't even tell anybody what you're encouraged about? Have you ever got excited and couldn't even tell anybody what you were excited about? Have you ever went to bed worried and got up dancing the Bible said weeping may endure for a night but joy joy cometh in the morning he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days 40 days 40 days 40 days and then he found himself back up in a cave have you ever gotten out of one thing and now you're into something else and the moment you get this straight, now you got to deal with that. And the moment you get through with that, you got to deal with the other. And now you're back in a cave again. You're in the cave and the devil said, uh-huh, you thought you was free, didn't you? You thought you was loose. You thought you was delivered. But here comes that same old spirit back. Here comes that same old depression. Here comes that old fear back again. But let me tell you something. The reason God let it come back again is because God has promised to utterly destroy the works of the enemy in your life. And you might be in a cave right now where you can't get out. 
and you can't get loose and you can't get free but I want you to get ready God's going to send a word that delivers you he's going to speak in your life tonight you might be watching by television but God is getting ready to come and rescue you he's getting ready to pull you out he's getting ready to set you free you need a word He's coming to get you. 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 Your mama left you. Your daddy left you. Your husband left you. Your wife left you. Your friends left you. You lost your job. The enemy is trying to tell you you're losing your mind. He's telling you you're having a nervous breakdown. But the devil is a liar. Your God is about to raise you up. I came to serve notice on the devil. Devil, your time is up. Your reign of terror is up. You thought you had us. But God is about to give us a breakthrough. Touch three people and tell them I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out. I don't know when. I don't know where. I don't know how. I don't know who. I don't know what, but I gotta get out of it. I gotta get out of it. I gotta get out of it. Tell somebody, tell them, excuse me, I'm coming out. I know you're used to me being depressed, but I'm coming out of this. I know you're used to me being worried, but I'm coming out of this. I know you used to have to encourage me, but I'm coming out of this. I know you normally have to loan me some money, but I'm coming out of this. I will come out. I will. I will. Tell somebody say, here come Jesus. I want to tell him, notice on you. You've been in the cave, but here comes Jesus. You've been in a depression, but here comes Jesus. You've been in a rut, but here comes Jesus. You've been overwhelmed, but here comes Jesus. Thought you wouldn't go make it, but here comes Jesus. He's coming into your trouble. He's coming into your crisis. He's coming into your storm. He's coming into your living. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. The Lord.